Warning. The following video contains a large quantity of content that has been determined to be relevant to the subject matter of this course. Viewer discretion is advised. Basic reasoning, critical thinking, is the practice of reliable belief formation. In other words, it is the practice of protecting ourselves against A, our own innate disposition to believe false beliefs, and B, the manipulations of others to get us into believing false beliefs. We are reliable belief formers when we use evidence and logic, strong evidence and good logic, to form beliefs. Now there's the question is, why do we sometimes fail to reliably form true beliefs? Why do we sometimes form false beliefs? And looking at the survey here, not get manipulated. Uh, manipulation by boyfriend, girlfriend. Car dealers try to trick. Politicians might fool you. And the number one answer is self-deception because you can't handle the truth. <laughs> alright, alright. It's ridiculous. An argument is a set of claims in which some of the claims, the premises, give support, evidence, or justification for the conclusion. The premises give evidence for or establish a line of reasoning to prove the conclusion is true. The conclusion is that which the premises try to prove. Premise 1. Either Fred or Sam or Kendra committed the murder. Premise 2. Fred did not do it. Premise 3. Kendra did not do it. Conclusion. Therefore, Sam committed the murder. One way to show the logical structure of an argument is through the method known as diagramming. Now, to diagram an argument, the main thing you remember is the arrows point, they flow, oh my, oh my gosh, the arrows follow the justification, so they show which way the justification is going. Okay, that's the pre that's premise one. That's premise two. And that's premise three. The reason I've connected them with pluses is because they work together to prove the conclusion. If you took one of them out, the other two would not give you much evidence for the conclusion. You can't know that Sam did it from knowing that Fred didn't do it and Kendra didn't do it unless you know that it was either Fred, Sam, or Kendra who committed the murder. The preceding is a deductive argument. Premises that are dependent are part of a deductive argument. In an inductive argument, the premises give support to the conclusion independently of each other. So you could take one of them away and you'd still have some evidence for the conclusion. Now, here's another one for you. And on this one, you have to imagine that there's a dog with a sensitive tummy, and the dog is named Spot, and that he did what's being described within a span of about 20 minutes. Okay, let's roll the argument, Kenny. Spot, Spot ate a large bag of cookies. Spot ate three boxes of ice cream. Spot ate a plate of spaghetti. Therefore, he will get sick. You see here, in this case, 
I've taken the premises and there's an arrow from each premise going to the conclusion. Each premise gives the conclusion a little bit of justification. After all, eating a large pack of cookies is some evidence he'll get sick. Now, all three premises make the conclusion more likely than one premise alone, but even one premise counts in favor of the conclusion. So, premises give evidence for the conclusion, and the conclusion is the thing you're trying to prove, or the arguer is trying to prove. And you can use those kinds of diagrams to just give an idea of how the justification's supposed to flow. The arrows always aim at the conclusion. Standard four. If you have structured an argument as follows, then you have already standardized an argument. Put it into standard form. Premise one, all persons are mortal. Premise two, Socrates is a person. Conclusion, therefore, Socrates is mortal. Well, I see. So the conclusion's at the bottom, and then the premises are on top. This form is standard because it is the standard that logicians and philosophers typically use. Oh, so whether you're in France or Ghana or United States, you're going to put the premises at the top and the conclusion at the bottom. Hmm. To put an argument in standard form, do the following steps. 1. Write down C, followed by therefore, and the conclusion at the bottom of your writing space, leaving space above for the premises. 2. P number each premise above the conclusion. So this... becomes this. In all my days, I've never seen a sunset as beautiful as the one in Muscatine, Iowa. They say the sunrise is also beautiful. I do not know, as I kept my lazy ass in bed all the time. I was at the U.S. Capitol in the summer of 2019, and Lucy took my picture by a statue of King Kamehameha, the first king of Hawaii. And there's a portrait of him. There I am with the statue. And then here's the portrait of King Kamehameha. We're going to use what's called the C and P method to pull the argument out of a passage by humorist and writer Mark Twain. In the following passage, Twain argues for a conclusion that most would call racist. Others might contend that the argument and its conclusion are not racist. Later, we'll show that the argument has a false assumption, a false premise. For now, we are just using it as a real-life example of an argument that is hard to pull apart. So how do we figure out what the conclusion and premises are? I don't think much of Hawaiian royalty. Years ago, when the late king and the present king were only princes, youths, they traveled in the U.S. with the premier of the kingdom, Dr. Judd, an American. Some accounts say they went to, into dinner, but observing their black faces and uninformed of their rank, the steward enforced the rule of the boat, excluding colored persons from the cabin table. They were naturally incensed, and all that could afterwards be done failed to wipe from their minds the affront. Yet at its worst, it was one that only was offered them as unknown and merely private individuals, and being entirely unofficial, could not affect them as princes or their country through them, and should have been so received and so valued. The men were only insulted, not the princes, and thus their country was no more insulted than if the affront had been offered to the commonest in the realm. The king has never forgotten or forgiven that trifling stab at his little vanity. 
how to pull an argument out of a passage you find in real life, like the Twain passage. The C and P method for finding arguments in a passage. Ask yourself these questions. Number one, is the passage trying to prove something? If so, the claim it is trying to prove is the conclusion. So as you read through it, ask yourself, what's it trying to prove? What's it trying to prove? Secondly, is evidence or a line of reasoning being given to support that claim, the conclusion? If so, the sentences containing the evidence or reasoning are the premises. So once you've figured out what the conclusion is, you can just read back through it and pull out every claim you think is being said in order to support the conclusion. So I'm reading the passage over and over. What's he trying to prove? What's he trying to prove? And the conclusion I come up with is that he's trying to prove that the king should not have seen the insult that happened to him when he was a child as an offense to his country, then the country of Hawaii. He should not have taken the slight as an offense to the country of Hawaii. That's Twain's conclusion. I'm typing in the conclusion at the bottom of my writing space. Therefore, the king of Hawaii should not have taken being forbidden to eat with whites as an insult to his country. Now that I have the conclusion, I need to figure out what the premises are. So by the C&P method, now I say, what are the premises? What's the evidence? How do I figure out the evidence that, um, that Twain is giving that the king of Hawaii shouldn't have taken the um, being kept away from the white people in the restaurant part of the ship's cabin as an insult to the country of Hawaii. Hmm. So, well, what I'll do, I'll just take each piece of evidence. So let me just go through. Let's try this now. Premise one. The ship steward was unaware that the king was Hawaiian royalty when he refused to let him dine in the whites only cabin. Premise two. So while the steward insulted the king as a person of color by turning him away, he did not insult the country of Hawaii. Conclusion. Therefore, the king of Hawaii should not have taken being forbidden to eat with whites as an insult to his country. So one thing you might notice is that the conclusion, as I've stated it in that last version of the argument, is not explicitly stated in Twain's argument. It's more of an art than a science to reconstruct an argument. And I've taken a kind of uh, complex case, and I've done the best I could with it, but I just wanted you to get the feel for how what's involved in pulling an argument out of a passage. First, find the conclusion. Then once you know what the conclusion is, go back through the passage and look for the pieces of evidence. It is an art, but you want the end result to be such so that if Mark Twain, if we could bring him back from the dead right now and he saw my reconstruction, he would say, brains, I need bra No, no. He would say, that really is what I meant. And to put it even into a more clear form, premise one, if you don't know a person is representing a country, you cannot insult their country by insulting that person. Premise two, the ship steward did not know the king of Hawaii was representing Hawaii because he didn't know he was Hawaiian royalty. Conclusion, therefore the ship steward could not have insulted the country of Hawaii by insulting the king.
premise indicators are words or expressions that indicate here comes a premise, here comes evidence. There must be a God because someone had to create everything. There must be a God for someone had to create everything. There must be a God since someone had to create everything. There must be a God on account of the fact that someone had to create everything. Conclusion indicators say, here comes the conclusion. Socrates is a man, so he is mortal. Socrates is a man, hence he is mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore he is mortal. Socrates is a man, thus he is mortal. Socrates is a man, from this it follows that he is mortal. So Justin Bieber was coming home from work and a bunch of fans were gathered around in front of his New York apartment and uh, he was not happy about that. And he actually gave them what you could call a moral argument. This is my home, you know what I mean? This is where I live, and I don't appreciate you guys being here. You guys can be anywhere else, this is my home, you know? This is where I, you know, at the end of the night when you come home, you want to relax, this is my space to do that. So I'd appreciate you guys for coming to Can I get a phone? Yes. Uh, you know, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Respect. Okay. I leave, yeah. So the first thing I'm looking for using that CNP method is what's the conclusion that Bieber is trying to establish? And the more I think of it, the conclusion is that it is wrong for these fans to be in front of my New York City apartment. Bieber's home space argument. Yo, yo, I feel you, I feel you. But this is my home. You know what I'm saying? This is my home. This is where I come after I record all that great music to relax, and I can't have you people here. You understand what I'm saying? No, you can't get a hug. If you violate a person's home space, then you do something morally wrong. The fans who waited in front of Bieber's apartment violated his home space. Therefore, the fans who waited in front of Bieber's apartment did something morally wrong. The F and F method for evaluating arguments. When evaluating a premise, the first question to ask yourself is whether it is false or true. Could the premise be an assertion that sounds good on the surface but that is actually false? If all premises are true, the second question to ask yourself is whether the conclusion really follows from them. Do the premises really get you to the conclusion? Or is the evidence... <laughs> professor Trudy Govier is a Canadian philosophy professor who gave us the ARG method. A. Acceptability. Are all premises true or acceptable? If so, we can move to R, relevance. Do the premises give some reason for believing the conclusion? Do they count in favor of the conclusion? If so, then we move to G, grounds. Do the premises give enough reason for believing the conclusion? Do they actually ground it or justify believing it? Try your own hand at this by doing the lecture size on the basics of basic reasoning in this unit.